good to be here. I recognize a lot of folks in the room, and I uh, recognize a lot of you from previous BBD meetings. So um, th there's been some really good work done over the years, you know, starting actually a, a long time ago. This is, in, in a lot of ways, this is a good disease to talk about because of how much we do know. Obviously, there's still a great deal we don't know, and there's some areas for uh, interesting changes in what we're learning. Uh, but there's a lot we know. And that leads us to how do we convert what we know into, into really good action steps at the producer level. Um, so let's, and, and the speakers before me have done a really good job outlining uh, BBD control, but I'm going to hit it one more time with an emphasis and, and tie it back to what uh, we're going to talk about with BBD consult. All right, so if I'm working, if I'm a private practitioner working with a producer, uh, and, and again, I, I'm going to have to admit, 90 some, 99, 98 percent of my work is beef cow calf rather than dairy. Uh, very little exposure to the dairy. I've talked to a lot of BVD researchers and, and veterinarians that work in the dairy side, but I don't have much uh, firsthand uh, pra uh, practical experience. But on the beef side, I feel like I've got some uh, experience. So when we're talking about BVD control, there's a couple things that I, I think from the bigger picture, stepping back as the veterinarian, is I want to reduce the likelihood that BVD is going to come into a herd that doesn't currently have uh, BVD circulating at levels that's going to cause any problems. I also want to be able to help a herd that has a BVD problem. The BVD virus is circulating in the herd and causing problems. I want to be able to, to initially limit that and then eliminate it. Um, and and in doing that, I want to minimize the negative impacts of, of BBD for, for uh, beef cattle operations. And that's both the cost of the virus, but also the cost of control. Uh, I don't want the cost of control to exceed uh, what the cost of the, the disease was going to be. So specifically, when I work with a, a cow-calf production unit, I want to have a strategy that I feel fairly comfortable will prevent the creation of PI calves on that, on that ranch. I also am going to do that through the use of vaccinations. I think we have some good vaccinations that provide pretty good protective immunity, not 100 percent. If, if, if our vaccines had provided 100 percent protective immunity, we would never see DVD in vaccinated herds, and that's not the case. And so, but at the same time, I think vaccinations provide us a great deal of protection. So I'm going to improve herd immunity. I'm going to specifically concentrate on the dam so that I am confident in her immunity and herd immunity during gestation. Um, I'm also going to do some things from a biosecurity standpoint to try to keep that pregnant animal away from likely sources of BVD virus, whether I've actually tested and confirmed or just because they're in a higher risk group, I'm trying to keep them away from my pregnant cows. So that's how I'm going to try to keep BVD out of a ranch or a farming operation. If a herd has BBD, I want to be able to find and remove those PI calves and get them back to being a negative, negative herd. Um, as, been, has, as has been uh, clearly stated, these PI calves are kind of somewhat unique within uh, veterinary medicine in that they have a very high and very persistent viremia. Um, virus is secreted by all body secretions so that it doesn't uh, basically contact with anything uh, coming off of or uh, the infected PI can pass the virus onto uh, animals in contact. And it doesn't take very long. One of the things when I give these types of talks as we move farther west where uh, ranching operations are much more extensive, I get some feedback that says, well, in these larger extensive areas, there's not that much contact between PI calves and, and pregnant cows. They're, they're spread out. And I would say that's true, and I think that's a great thing, except do you ever gather them? Do you ever move them to another pasture? Do you ever gather them to brand calves? And if you gather them at all, and in those situations, a lot of times I've got potential PI calves in very close contact with pregnant cows during a critical time when we form PIs just in our normal management practices. So I will admit, I'm not, no. I'm not even sure how much I'm going to admit that being in an extensive management area reduces contact with PIs. I'm, I'm not sure that it does, or at least it doesn't enough to significantly reduce my risk, all right? Um, 
there has been some work that shows a little more. So I'm mostly concerned about nose-to-nose -nose contact, relatively close contact. There's a little bit of research that says you can go a little farther than nose-to-nose, -nose, but I would say not, not much. So, and that's a good thing for us in that relatively short distances uh, provide a pretty good barrier between PIs and, and um, cattle that could become infected. I'm not willing to say what that distance is, but it's probably not nearly as, as transportable by air as some of the, the viruses we see in other species. Um, I tend to focus on the persistently infected animal, and, and I, I think I'm justified in doing that because of that very high, very persistent viremia. That being said, those temporarily or transiently infected animals can spread the virus to, to susceptible animals in generally not at the same efficiency, but it, it's not zero. And so you have to have at least a little bit of consideration of those temporary or transiently infected animals. Um, Dan and Dan talked about um, how this virus is spread. But basically, I'm going to, and I use this slide a lot with producers, is that most of the time we have a cow that is not a persistently infected cow. So she, uh, she is herself not in, uh, persistently infected. But if she's exposed to the virus during critical stages of gestation, she can then cause that positive or that persistently infected calf. And the most common source is a persistently infected calf in the herd that she's in contact with. Can be other sources, but uh, in my opinion, most commonly would be the, the PI calf. That's where we get those PI calves that are born if it isn't aborted. And a lot of times they will be aborted. And I, if they were all aborted, that would be good. Um, but they're not. Some of them survive to be born. Uh, and as Dan pointed out, a few of those animals, and not very many, uh, can make it all the way up to become a reproducing heifer, in which case she is persistently infected. She will always have a persistently infected calf. And that's why when he talked about the testing strategies, a negative test on a calf pretty much proves that the cow is negative. But a positive test on the calf gives me enough incentive to go test his dam, but I expect her to be negative as well. So he said 7%. I, I think that's a pretty good number. So pretty low number, but not zero. So it's worth going back and testing that cow. So within, within the cow herd, PIs, so I, I work um, both with cow herds and with stalker and feedlot operations. In stalker and feedlot operations, the, the, the pattern of finding PI positives is more consistent. You know, so if in a certain area it's, it's four, four tenths of a percent, it's fairly closely four tenths of a percent most months, most, time, most of the time. Cow calf is very different. So when we see positives, they are clustered. So I don't I expect herds to either have zero PIs or several. I don't really expect to come in and find one. That would be unusual, and I would have to investigate why that would be. So I don't. So in a cow-calf situation, I expect the herds to either have one or several PIs. Uh, so most herds are going to be zero percent, as Dan pointed out. In infect in affected herds, that number can get quite high. Uh, Ten percent, I think, is yeah. I, I, that's a, I'm, I'm comfortable with that number. It's somewhat pulled out of the air. Uh, could be a little bit higher, but that's in those situations where I go in and I, I find a lot of PIs in one herd. Uh, as far as the herd survey, uh, herd prevalence, again, Dan pointed out, you know, somewhere he said, I think, did you say 7% for that? Um, or, you know, you added up to 12 because of the different, yeah. I, I tend to say 10 or less. And so we're in the same ballpark of herds. So 90% of herds do not have any PI calves but 10% do. So a lot of times I'm sp speaking to practicing veterinarians. You know, in a typical mixed animal practice in Kansas, you're going to have a couple hundred clients. That means that of those clients, you've got 10 or 20 that have PI calves, even though the majority of your clients, the vast majority of your clients do not. All right. And so at, from a veterinary standpoint, yes, most herds are not infected, but most practices have a number of clients that do have persistent infected calves and, and would benefit from some more aggressive uh, uh, intervention. All right, so when we talk about, again, what, what I would like veterinary practitioners and beef producers to talk about is how can I find and remove PI animals as they exist? And I'm going to use 
the biosecurity measures that are that are available on most cow calf operations to try to limit that spread. And so that's um, purposeful grouping of cattle, purposeful uh, isolation of cattle from other types of cattle. So and and so when I say high risk cattle, to me, in my experience with with working with uh, cow calf ranches in the area of the country where I have worked. One of the most high-risk groups is um, stalker calves that I might purchase and bring in. In that, if in my stalker calves, my lightweight stalker calves, maybe a half a percent, so five out of a thousand, are PI, and I buy a group of stalker calves and I run them fence line against my pregnant cows, and I bought three or four hundred of them, what's the chance that one of them is a PI? Pretty decent. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to run stalker calves fence line contact with my pregnant cows. So that's the type of conversations I have with beef producers of, of things we can do to, from a biosecurity standpoint to try to reduce the risk to my cow herd. Uh, I'm perfectly, I think it's very good from a, from an overall cow herd management, grass management to have some flexibility in the number of cows you're running or number of cattle you're running so that some years you buy stalkers and some years you don't. I, I think that's a great idea, but just have some some biosecurity concepts in mind as you as you think about that. Um, and I, I don't want to minimize the use of vaccinations. I think vaccinations greatly reduce the severity of um, impact in the, in, in the situations when BVD enters a herd. I also think it reduces the risk that BVD will get a foothold in a herd. So I, I, I want to start with a good vaccination program for my cow-calf herds. All right. But I also know, working with veterinarians and beef producers that a textbook BVD control program is probably not appropriate for very many situations other than the textbook. All right? And, and I, I feel that strongly that we as advice givers must give advice that's appropriate and flexible for the situation. Um, so there's a lot of different types of operating. Do they bring in stalker cattle? Yes or no. What kind of fence line contacts with other herds do they have? Um, how large of a herd is. All of those things uh, are, are going to impact the type of control program that should put in place for a herd. So to start with, a herd that has BVD circulating in the herd is a very different um, intervention strategy than a herd that does not. So we'll start with that. Um, high risk and low risk activities. That would be, do they buy stalker cattle? Do they, do they trade cows? Do they, do they have quite a bit of potential exposure to BVD or very little potential exposure to BVD PI calves. Um, are they a, a risk averse or a risk taking client? Um, and in private practice, you will have the, the whole range. Our purebred producers tend to be very risk averse because of the, the negative impact, the traceability, those types of things. Other people are, are, are in the cattle business to take advantage of, of price swings. And so they're, they're, actively involved in purchasing and selling, and so they're going to be much more risk-taking from that's from the opportunity to bring in the virus, and that's okay. We just need a, a specific control program for those different types of clients. Um, Dan talked about surveillance. We're getting good surveillance tools. Uh, I, I could always use better, but we're getting good surveillance tools, and how best to use them is going to depend on the situation. And Will the producer, can they make any adjustments in their management? Uh, and Dan brought up a, a very good example of prolonged calving seasons. Can they change that or not? And that's going to impact whether um, a, a BBD control program will work or what kind of BBD control program uh, will be best. All right? Because of the complexity, because of the fact that I don't think a textbook plan is really the best for most producers. I think that to sit down and really go through a, a conversation that allows a, a practitioner and a producer to set up the best program for them takes a lot of knowledge, takes a little bit of time, and it takes a good, uh, some buy-in from the client to work with that veterinarian. So this is the traditional approach of supplying information that might help that decision. I was part of the uh, BVD uh, working groups and committees with both the, or with the AVC, the Academy of Veterinary Consultants, the AABP, the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, as well as the NCBA. And I was involved in these committees that had a lot of the same speakers that you've got in this room, as well as producers and practitioners. 
And um, I, I think we, as a group, did a really good job pulling together a lot of the really good information about BVD, and we put it up as BVD info um, on, the, on the website. I think it's really well done. Guess how many people went to it? Not many. <laughs> I think it was an excellent piece of work. But what I'm asking someone to do is, okay, we've provided, and what we did, we did the work of finding the good articles, and we put it up on this website. Your work is to go find those articles, read them, understand them, integrate them into the uh, individual specific situations, and give good advice. We didn't get a lot of uptake on that proposal. Um, so I, I, in some, I still have this residual pride in this because I think we did a good job pulling the information together. But it became obvious to us that we... You can do something well, and it doesn't matter. I, and, and that's what I think happened. Uh, and so this same group continued talking and said, well, what, what would work? What would be a way that this could have some traction uh, at the, at the, at the decision-making level? And we came up with consult. Actually, I think, I think the name came from uh, Sherry Merrill. I'll give her credit for it anyway. Um, but what it really came from was to create something that, veterinary practitioners and beef producers to go to and in an interactive method um, set up a, a uh, specific, that's the word I wanted, specific control program that it meets their needs. Um, we wanted the, the recommendations to be evidence-based, to have data behind them, but we wanted it to be an interactive so that not everyone ended up with the same recommendation. So I didn't want the textbook recommendation. I wanted variety. Basically, the concept, and I, I'm going to forget who, I forget who to give credit to, because this was groupthink, right? This is a committee work. But the idea was really to mimic the conversation with an expert. And everybody that was involved with consult had taken a lot of phone calls from veterinarians and producers, and we had a really good idea in our mind what that, con what that, that, what that phone conversation would be like. So the consult was set up to mimic a phone conversation with a expert, okay? And it also, I'm gonna, we, we built obviously on the, the shoulders of giants, all right? And, and this is one of the papers that I like particularly well. Uh, Dave Smith, Dale Grovolution, others um, published this paper and, I, and it, it was, this is the concept that we're getting to, kind of that branching decision tree, different things for different people. So in their paper, they started out with, well, think about the, the, the things that would make you give a different answer. So you'd start with, is the herd BBD positive or negative? So if they're negative, can they institute biosecurity? No, they don't think they can. All right, so we'll go with vaccination. Can you do that? Uh, if you can't do anything, well, okay, we're done with the conversation, but we've had a conversation. If you say, on the other hand, that, yeah, I could institute some biosecurity, explain to me what that is, and then you, you kind of go through and explain what different types of biosecurity might be and with that biosecurity, a lot of times it involves some surveillance so you get a better idea of is BVD truly circulating in my herd, in what subpopulations, and those types of things. And so you get the concept of this, this branching decision tree. In contrast, a herd that's BVD positive, you'd, you'd ask some of the same questions. Well, what can we do? Can we do some biocontainment? Well, I don't think I can. Can we at least vaccinate? Well, yes or no, and, and we'll go from there. Assuming we can have the conversation and, yeah, we can do some biocontainment, well, what would that be? And you could start the conversation of what you would do in a positive herd to impact that herd and then come back to the question of, okay, I think I got rid of it. Is it still circulating in the herd or not? So I think this paper was very helpful in the bigger, the bigger group's understanding of how we could maybe approach this from a, a – um, Specific, you know, to set up specific recommendations for different situations. So this is the BBD consult team. A couple of us from K-State, Dale Grotolution, Dave Smith, Dan Gibbons, Richard Randall, and then Sherry Merrill. Um, and, and I would say that I'm pretty pleased with this group as far as their level of expertise, but we've, we were building on the shoulders of other people's work and, a, and the body of research that was out there in this, in this area. And so this is what we came up with was BBD Consult, which is available at BBD Consult, all right? B or BBDinfo.org or BBD Consult. You can get at it either way. Um, it's actually the same 
website as what I was so proud of before. Um, so that if you were used to coming to that, you can find BVD Consult there, or you can go straight to BVD Consult. Um, that being said, I couldn't stop using those articles that we pulled together. So if you want to, go read those articles, digest them, understand them, implement them in a, in a way that's great for your clients. They're there. We didn't throw them away. All right, they're there. They're under res and there's even more under resources. We put our favorites on the front of the page, and there's more on the resources. I'm not holding my breath about anybody actually going there, but I couldn't throw them away. All right. Uh, so, if you click though, and you want to start on the consult process, you'd click on BBD Consult. We have a little bit of a welcome page, and basically it says we're going to walk you through several questions. And again, the concept was this would be much like I get the phone call from a veterinarian or a producer that's having a BBD problem. What would be my first question? What would be my follow-up question? That's the, the series of questions that are going to um, come up on BBD Consult. Um, of, of, of course, if you change your mind with the feedback you get, you can go back, you can redo it, you, you, you know, you don't, you're not stuck with, with the answers you give. All right, so the first question is, do you have active BBD in your herd? And we forced you into one of two answers, either yes or no or I don't know. And, and believe me, we had some debates about a lot of these um, questions. And at first we were wondering about, you know, having three, yes, no, I don't know. But we found that the, the no and I don't know were basically the same. We brought it around to the same, the same answer. So we, we put those together. And so if you say, yeah, I have BVD in my herd, um, we say a little bit of information. Glad you know that BVD can have some impact. We're going to help you set up a plan to limit the negative effects and eliminate the the virus from your herd if possible. Um, so, yes, we have BBD. You say, or the other one was no, I don't think I do, or I don't know. I went to a talk, they said something about BBD. I have no idea if it's on my ranch or not. Well, click, click the no or I don't know. And basically it says we're going to create a plan that will minimize the chance that you will get BBD if you don't and discover if you do, if you do. All right, so we're going to go, we'll go on from here and figure out where you really are. All right. So if you answered yes, I do have BVD, then the follow-up question is, will you institute a testing strategy to remove BVD PI cash from your herd? I want to point out, though, if you answered no, this isn't the follow-up question. There's a different follow-up question if you answered no to the first question. So this, it's starting to be specific for the situation and the phone call that's going on, all right? So if you answered, yes, I have BVD on my herd, and yes, I will institute a testing strategy that will find those PI calves and remove them, uh, we give you, first of all, a pat on the back, wise decision. We think that's a good idea. It gives you a little bit more information. All right, by testing and removing the PI animals, you'll greatly reduce the impact of BVD very rapidly, all right? Now, if on the same strain, same phone call, yes, I do have BVD, will you institute a testing strategy? Mm, no, you haven't sold me. I'm not going to. Well, then we give you, um, and someone else had to write this one because the one I wrote they took out. Right? <laughs> this is not a wise choice. Right? This is, I, I used a different word, but this is not a wise choice. All right? and it says testing is the best control strategy. It will be difficult to remove BVD from your herd if you're not willing to test. And remember, this is only coming from that, yes, I have BVD. All right, so if you have BVD and I'm not willing to test, we kind of slap you upside the head a little bit, all right? Um, so there are six to 10 questions in BVD consult, and the six to 10 is based on the choices that you make. And so think of it as a, a branching algorithm coming down. And so we end up with like, uh, like 155, 156 different potential combinations of answers to those questions. And so I guess it's not, it's not um, specific for every ranch in the country, but there's 156 different ways you could put together the advice that we think is appropriate for those different types of situations. All right? So six to ten questions designed to mimic a phone conversation between a veterinarian or producer that, that's concerned about BBD. The way we formed the questions were, and, and the idea behind it was to get buy-in from the producer, 
was we asked the questions in a way, are you willing and able to test for persistently infected animals? Are you willing and able to vaccinate heifers with an approved, uh, an appropriate program? Are you willing and able to vaccinate cows with an appropriate program? So it puts the onus on that conversation with a producer. And so picture a veterinarian sitting with their producer and say, are you willing and able to vaccinate your heifers in a recommended way? Yes or no? And so by saying yes, you've gotten some agreement that that, that's what we're going to follow through with. That's what we're going to do. If you say no, then you can have a conversation of, you know, where we keep our heifers. It's so inconvenient. I just don't think I can pull it out. So the, the, the beauty of this program is then you just click no. I can't. And you still get an answer. It might have some warnings with it, but you still say, given your situation, this is the best we can do. All right. So it gives you an answer. And again, remember, I gave you the option that you can go back and go, and if, and if you get all the way through it and you go, you know, this is the one weak spot in your program. And I'm, I'm the veterinarian. I'm talking to you. This is the one weak spot. Can we work on this? And if the answer is still no, it's still no. But if it's yes, and see, I've, I've used this as a lever to say, let's, this is the one weak spot. Let's go work on that. And then you'll have a much better program. So I'm, my opinion is this is a good conversation, a good communication tool to, to have really good productive conversations between the veterinarian and, and uh, pr uh, producer. There's also more information available. For a lot of these questions, I, I might not know the answer to this. And so we have more information available, and that's that little blue icon, and it shows up on every question. So even on the very first question, do you have BVD in your herd or not, a, a very reasonable person might go, well, that was my question. <laughs> right? And so you click on the I button, and it goes through some of the things that Dan talked about. Well, how would I know if BBD is in my herd? Well, these are some of the things to think about. And, it, and they're, not, they're not huge in their, in their text, but they're based on the literature, based on the published literature, and it gives you the information you need. If you don't need that, then don't click the I. And, and so that gets away from that, you know, those pages and pages of articles that you have to read through and, and try to sift through. Basically, you get more information on the things you want more information on. If you don't want more information, you just answer the questions. All right. So based on your experience, based on your knowledge base, you may or may not use them. All right. So on this one, will you use an appropriate BVD vaccination strategy in heifers? If you say, well, Doc, what is an appropriate BVD vaccination strategy for heifers? Well, click the I button. We provided more information. And we pulled this from some of the published literature again. And what we did was we used the green, yellow, red connotations of green is good, yellow, not our favorite, but we can't really say it's wrong. And red is we really don't think you ought to do that. Right? And so we give you some, um, some options there. One thing I want to point out, this is the, the colors change depending on how you answered previous questions. So if you're a higher risk taker, we're going to add, we're going to put the green, you know, down to the bottom. You, you have to do this if you're, if you are at high risk. If you, if you're at very low risk, you know, gosh, I don't have really fence line contact with anybody, uh, other than, you know, my brother's herd and he's on the same health program I am and that kind of stuff. Well, then, yes, and then the green goes up farther, the yellow goes up farther. It, you've got more options. So I want you to point out, even though I, I displayed this one, this is not the one. <laughs> there are several of these, and that would be true for many of the, the questions that we ask. We're going to give you specific, or specific, recommendations based on how you've answered the questions that have led up to that. All right. So then after you've clicked yes or no to each question, right, you're going to get that short paragraph response. You've kind of seen what the responses are like and a follow up question based on not only just that previous question, but the whole pathway you're coming down. So whatever combination of questions you've asked up to that point, it's going to give you a response. Right. And Again, this is this is designed to be pretty specific. And again, think about it as a phone conversation with an expert. And I can remember oh, it's getting harder. But assuming I can remember how you've answered previous questions, it's going to influence how I'm going to take you down. All right. The last question. So the sixth or the tenth question or whoever. The last question is, will you apply appropriate surveillance methods? I can almost guarantee you everybody's going to say, I don't know what that is. What's an appropriate? I could go to most of my colleagues at the university and say, would you apply an appropriate surveillance method? They said, you'd have to tell me what that is. And so we went to the literature. We based it on what we found in the literature. So under more information, again, and, and you saw this in Dan's talk. His, his paper is one of the ones that we really use to help 
um, drive this. And again, you see the red green connotation. And I want to tell you again that it's different. The colors are different. The, the wording is the same on everybody's recommendations, but the colors are different. So if you are particularly high risk, we're probably going to have a much more aggressive recommendation on surveillance. If you are at pretty low risk, you know, you can get by with much less aggressive surveillance, and that probably would be appropriate. So it makes it appropriate for the level of risk that you are currently taking, for the amount of risk you want to take. Um, it gives you something. It gives you some flexibility, some options, all right? And yet it still gives you our recommendations, all right? So it, it, it gives you what we think would be best, um, but it gives you options, all right? Um, so if you say, so the last question, will you apply appropriate surveillance methods? Yes, I, I've gone this far. I think I should. Then you get a summary statement. Basically, that's the bottom box on my, in my mind, I'm picturing this algorithm that's got 156 boxes on the bottom. So this is the bottom box. And it says, you've chosen a program that will eliminate BVD from your herd. You've done a great job. And I think in this one, I even left, eh, there was one thing you weren't doing quite right. We can talk about that. Um, work closely with your veterinarian. See if, if you can even tighten this up a little bit more or just implement what we, what we talked about. Um, if you want to revise your answers, go back and you're good. Then we can generate a report. So you just click on generate report and this can be printed. That can be emailed. It, it's, uh, you know, however you want to get it or keep it or store it. And basically what it does is it goes through um, the answers that you gave for each of the questions. So each, you know, each little box is the question that was asked and your answer. It documents the feedback that was given, such as this was a wise choice. This is not a wise choice. Um, put it in your file and come back to this next year. We can come back to this in a few months uh, and talk about it again. But we've documented exactly what our conversation was. So that's, that's BBD Consult. It's available today. It's been used quite a bit. Um, I think this is going to have some value for veterinarians, producers, again, because it, it allows both veterinarians and producers to make wise, evidence-based decisions without having to read all the literature on BVD that's out there. It kind of does a lot of that work for them, and it provides them with a way to, you know, really kind of customize for given situations uh, what, what kind of a control program they think they can really achieve and that will be successful at the level that, that you've decided that you want to live with. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, behind, behind you, Lee. I got a, a question, maybe a suggestion mm -hmm. on, the, on the consult. I would suggest that uh, if the producer goes through that and enter the name and address of the veterinarian, that that report also be sent to the vet so he knows that his client is mm -hmm. checking on that. You can pull up a conversation and carry it on. Yeah. But uh, uh, the question that I have is in relation to the breeding management and practices that uh, we have and how does that affect uh, the incidence of the disease. So we saw uh, a, a breeding season uh, uh, drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the way I'm seeing that is like you will increase the number of susceptible animals if the exposure occur during that window of time because you have more animals on that window of the time at a specific time. So are you seeing this on the on the field? Let me, if I don't answer your question appropriately, holler at me again. So uh, for the first part of your question was, um, we were careful about confidentiality in that we do, at, and I didn't show you this, but at the end we actually do have a brief survey. Are you a purebred or commercial operation? What's the general size of your herd? What state do you live in? Um, that information is sent to us, right? Not your name. So that on the, can you make it go back one slide? Yeah, there you go. Oh, this thing I can do it. All right. So at the top, you've uh, it's a little bit small. Sorry, guys. Um, but you got the herd name, the date it was prepared, who prepared it, that kind of stuff. That doesn't come to us, all right? That that and us being uh, at K State, all right. So the um, and we, we did that very purposefully. We don't, 
we don't feel like we would get as much uptake if we collected your name and address. But we did get some information about, you know, type of herd, um, size of herd, those types of things. And um, so we did not build in a way that it would automatically go to the veterinarian because that would have required more information than we wanted to collect and keep from a confidentiality standpoint. So if a client goes to this website and does the um, BVD consult, it would be on them to talk to their veterinarian about it. We do recommend that, but it would be totally on them to do that. Um, as far as some of the things like breeding season length and those kinds of things, actually a lot of that information is in the more information code. So things like setting up an appropriate testing strategy, in the more information it would say some information about breeding season length and, and a little bit about the test choices and those kinds of things. So if you, for those specific things, it, it kind of walks you through what to do in those situations under the more information. And, it, and it's at some point, so really the way it asks it is, is something like, and I've got to remember the wording exactly, but something like, can you, will you be willing and able to test all, and so if I'm coming down the positive track, um, calves before the start of the next breeding season? Well, if the answer is well, no, because I breed all the time, then with that no, it says, okay, this is going to be a challenge. And it, it might even back it out and say, I, we even have some of the ways coming down where you go, I don't recommend testing in your situation because it makes no sense. There's not a lot of those, but there's a few based on the answers that they give. You go, let's just go with vaccination and ride it out and you get what you get. And the report is basically, you have a program, you've left some holes in it, this is what we've decided. And then as you go down, it says, this is not a wise choice, this is not a wise choice, this is a wise choice, print it off, this is what we decided. Good communication. Not the answer I wanted, but we know what we said. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, uh, when I talk about the breeding season, uh, uh, the, the other question is, are, if you're seeing because uh, some herds do have a breeding season and they do concentrate mm -hmm. all the cows uh, being bred with synchronization on the first day of the breeding season, right. if that increased the incident of PI calves, in herds that are not being tested, there's, there's, I know of, I know of one, and I'm thinking there might be one other observational study, not real well controlled for confounding, that does indicate that more intensive management, such as vaccination and synchronization, increases your risk. And it probably has, if that is true, if that's a true representation of what's happening, it probably has to do with gathering cattle at a time frame when. PI creation is, is at high risk. Um, th those are, one was a, basically a subset of kind of the NOM study, um, and the other one was a study done out of the, the diagnostic lab at K-State. They kind of showed that that might, that, that some of the things we recommend that people do might actually be a risk factor. So, I, I, and that might be true. Lee, did you have something? I just, or, or, or Linda, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question when you were talking about the confidentiality of your results, which made me, do you all gather the results from your, uh, what, from this survey? I mean, obviously, what we gather not is a yeah, name or anything. No, not a name, but we gather which pathways people are coming down. So we know which pathways people are coming down a lot, occasionally, or hardly never. Never. You know, those, those types of things. So we do gather that. Thanks, and that's that's great work. I, this is a good resource not just for veterinarians with their clients, but I use it in teaching. Mm -hmm. I'll go through it next week with some students. But one one um, uh, when we say work closely with your veterinarian, I know in Georgia we're challenged, mm -hmm. and and both from a standpoint of veterinary client patient relationships and opportunities for that, but then also as far as just educating veterinarians on when to when to even think about BVD. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got any thoughts on that? Well, maybe, and again, if I, if I stray off of your question, wrote me back. But honestly, one of the reasons that we wanted to do consult was we think that not only do producers have a wide range of knowledge base, so do veterinarians. Um, and a lot of times it has to do with what percentage of their practice is involved with beef cattle. So if a high percentage of their practice is involved with beef cattle, usually they have at least a pretty good knowledge and, and some pretty good ideas about control strategies. If they're in a mixed animal practice where a relatively small percentage of their practice is, is uh, cattle, I, 
I was in mixed animal practice. There was tons of stuff I didn't know about things that I didn't do a lot. Uh, and so, honestly, that's one of the goals of the trick consult was I, I think any veterinarian that, you know, that took virology, that has some epidemiology, you know, they took, they took the classes in vet school, whether they remember all of it or some of it, um, that you could start with BBD consult and give pretty good advice. That I think it, it really is a backstop for veterinarians that have moderate amounts of moderate to little amounts of information and they can still provide and, and more than just the, the producer there themselves because the veterinarian yeah maybe I don't remember or, or know much about BBD but I but I know viruses and I know biology and I know the concepts of biosecurity and so as I'm going through this it makes sense to me I can give advice so we think it's a nice backstop to veterinarians that don't feel particularly confident and that's one of the things that I would say is um, I think if you're really confident about your knowledge of BBD, what it helps me do is have a thorough conversation, that I don't leave out steps, that I don't forget to say something that's important. Because I know a lot about BBD, I just run through my recommendations and the client got not much. It forces me to slow down, have a full conversation. Are you willing and able to do this? Why would I do that, Doc? Oh, I gotta explain that. Uh, you know, and if I'm a veterinarian that doesn't know very much, it goes through there and they go, well, Doc, why is that? Well, let's push the more information button and we'll, we'll look at that. So that's honestly kind of one of the concepts is that we, we think that it's going to have broad um, applicability across uh, levels of knowledge, both veterinarians and producers.